Power is significant for our devices. This is why we take a closer look at this topic. Linear or switching converters, buck, boost or buck boost, LDO, SEPIC, quiescent current and a few more passwords will be covered in this video. And of course, efficiency. In the end, you should be able to decide on the right regulator for your project. I'm not sure if I can avoid some magic smoke and we will see that you cannot always trust the salespeople. Let's see YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. Most of our modern processors and sensors need a stable power supply of 3.3 volts. Some older chips require 5 volts. And the Raspberry Pi needs nearly 1 ampere, while an ESP in deep sleep requires only a few microamperes. So we will discuss the two different principles for control of voltage, linear and switching regulators. We will find out why linear regulators' efficiency often is bad and where this fact is not significant. We also look at the thermal design and how it influences maximum current. We try to understand why switching regulators have higher efficiencies and can be built smaller for high currents or high differences between input and output voltage. We look at the output ripple and on other high frequency signals and where they can hurt. We will test how the different regulators behave when your processor is in deep sleep. Finally, you should be able to make the right decision for your project. And you should be able to do small talk using the buzzwords mentioned before. We get power from various sources like a 220 or 110 volts grid, from different batteries or from solar panels. We always have the same diagram, an input which is connected to the source with a particular voltage, a voltage regulator and an output with a stable voltage, which is connected to our device. The most important two questions at the beginning of a project are what voltage do we need at the output of the regulator and what voltage or voltage range do we expect at the input. An important decision is whether we want to use a linear or switching regulator. What is the difference between the two? To test the different regulators I built a small test bench, a power supply, an instrument to measure voltage and ampere at the entry of the regulator, the regulator itself, a device to measure voltage and ampere at the output and a variable load simulating our microprocessor. This is only a basic setup and my results will not always be completely exact. But I hope they are accurate enough to make the point. To avoid the question, where did you get these lovely meters? I built them myself using 3D printed cases and a cheap meter. The link to the meter is in the description. And yes, I will show you how my new Prusa MK3 works in a later video, including how I designed such cute small boxes. So stay tuned. A linear regulator consists of two parts, a variable resistor to destroy the unnecessary volts and a controller to adjust this resistor to achieve a constant output voltage. Let's assume for a moment we have 13.3 volts at the input and need 3.3 volts at the output at a current of 500 milliampere. Why 13.3 volts? Because it does not matter too much for our example and engineers like simple numbers to use mental arithmetic. The necessary resistor therefore is 13.3 minus 3.3 which is 10 volts divided by 0.5 ampere equals 20 ohms. In such a stable situation we would not need a voltage regulator. A simple resistor would do the job. So let's try if I'm right. My load is 500 milliampere and my power supply is at around 13.3 volts. This is my 20 ohm resistor. Actually it is 22 ohms. When I switch the load on we have 3.3 volts and 500 milliamperes at the output. Shit! What happens here? Magic smoke? Not good. The resistor destroys itself in seconds and the smell is not healthy. What happened? For sure too much heat for this poor resistor. This leads to an important topic of linear regulators, power dissipation. 
Before his sudden death, this poor little resistor was rated for 0.5 watts power dissipation. Obviously it got more than that. We can calculate the killing power. As we saw before, its share was 10 volts. That is what he had to kill times 0.5 ampere equals 5 watts, which was 20 times over his rating. If I want a working device, I have to use bigger resistors like these. Together, they also have 20 ohms, but are rated at 4 times 5 equals 20 watts. Still, this setup gets hot after a while. If we want a working concept, we need a bigger heatsink and mount the resistors on it. But is this really what we want? This leads us to the next topic, efficiency. Our microprocessor, the load, needed 3.3 volts times 0.5 ampere equals 1.65 watts. And our resistor dissipated 5 watt. Efficiency is defined as output divided by input. 3.3 times 0.5 divided by 13.3 times 0.5 equals 0.25 or 25%. Not a lot. This is more a heating element than a power supply. We will later try to solve this issue. And we see that because input and output currents are the same, the efficiency is always the same for all currents. It gets worse with higher input voltages. Next we assume that our device only needs 0.5 ampere for a moment during startup. After that it just needs 0.1 ampere. Let's check what happens when we reduce the current consumption to 0.1 ampere. The voltage at our device increases with each milliampere less current. And at 100 milliampere the voltage we get is 11.3 volts instead of 3.3 volts at the output. Fortunately, I did not use one of my favorite ESP32 boards for this test, because I cannot watch them die in front of my eyes. Here I'm similar to a surgeon, but if I make a mistake, my killed parts end in the drawer, not on the cemetery. This was the main reason I chose to become an engineer and not a surgeon. Less stress. You see, Without the controller or regulation, no constant voltage can be produced for a variable load. Let's exchange this simple resistor with a real voltage regulator. The first we try is an old acquaintance, an LM or AMS1117 for 3.3 volts, a regulator often used in Node MCU boards. I use the one in a SOT232 package. Same scenario as before. We start at 13.3 volts and 500 milliampere. As soon as the load is on, the voltage drops to nearly zero. Why is that? The datasheet says max current 1 ampere. Let's look a little closer to the datasheet. Here it says that our SOT232 package increases its case temperature by 90 degrees centigrade for each watt it has to dissipate. Let's do the calculation. The resistor had to dissipate 5 watts and so does the AMS1117 now. Remember, linear regulators are only variable resistors with a controller. 5 times 90 equals 450 degrees. Like that we could use our regulator as a soldering iron. But the datasheet also says the maximum junction temperature is only 125 degrees. This is why the internal protection immediately regulated the current down to a supportable value to protect the device. This time, fortunately, no magic smoke. We can get a similar regulator in a bigger TO220 package, which increases its temperature only 24 degrees per watt, which should result in 5 times 24 equals 120 degrees centigrade. This concept works but of course would not be called best practice because you do not want to run your regulator at this high temperature. Let's assume this 0.5 ampere is only for a moment during boot up and during normal operation our device would only consume 0.1 ampere. The dissipation then would just be 1 watt. According to the datasheet the regulator would only run at 
1 times 24 degrees equals 24 degrees. So it would not heat up at all because this is the ambient temperature in my lab. Really? No, of course not. We always have to add the ambient temperature, but it would still run below 50 degrees. If we need more power, we could mount it on a heatsink. Then the degrees per watt value would be reduced and so the temperature. You see, reading datasheets sometimes is a good thing. Before the magic smoke escapes or afterwards. Depends on your personality. Let's look at another widespread scenario. We have 5 volts from USB as input and 3.3 volts at the output. The power dissipation is only 0.85 watt at 500 milliampere and 0.17 watt at 100 milliampere. The efficiency would be 66%, much better than the 25% from before. So to get 3.3 volts from USB, a linear regulator is probably an excellent idea. Small, cheap and simple to use. Just do not forget the two capacitors at the in and output suggested in all data sheets. Now we reduce the input voltage to 4 volts and we see that the output voltage is less than 3.3 volts. Our microprocessor would start to suffer at these voltage levels. This is because all regulators need a voltage called dropout voltage to regulate the output. Our AMS1117 needs typically 1.1 volts to do the job. At 4 volts, he is no more able to support the 3.3 volts at the output. If we replace it with a similar one, an HT7333, we see that this one does its job also below 4 volts. This regulator needs only a dropout voltage of 0.11 volt and therefore is called low dropout regulator or LDO. I know, they call the AMS1117 also an LDO regulator. But who believes in what salespeople write? How can we avoid the problem of power dissipation? There is a simple concept. If we switch the power off, we do not dissipate any heat because no current is flowing. Unfortunately, we also have no voltage at the output. And if we switch the power entirely on, we have no voltage across the switch and therefore also no power dissipation. But of course, we get the full 13.3 volts at the output. Both possibilities are not very useful for our purpose. But if we switch between these two states, on and off, and put an inductor as an energy tank at the end, it does the trick. If we change fast enough, we get a voltage between 0 and 13.3 volts. And if we choose the right ratio between on and off times, we can reach our 3.3 volts. Without any loss, as we saw before. Under ideal circumstances, of course. A fascinating concept. Now our controller has to adjust the on-off ratio instead of the resistor value. Here I have such a switching regulator, which was suggested by a viewer. Its input voltage is 12 to 24 volts and its output voltage can also be adjusted to 3.3 volts. And it should support staggering 3 amperes. By the way, these regulators are called step-down or buck converters because their output voltage is lower than their input voltage. The first impression is entirely different from the linear regulators before. It is bigger and has more parts. Its integrated circuit, however, is tiny and for sure cannot dissipate a lot of heat. By the way, if you see one of these small inductor coils, the chance you look at a switching and not a linear regulator is relatively high. We use the same scenario as before. Input 13.3 volts and output 3.3 volts at 0.5 ampere. No problem at all. It delivers the 500 milliampere without a sweat. We even can go up to 1 ampere. The voltage drops a bit, but this is mainly because I do not use the 4-wire method shown when I tested the USB cables. Let's calculate the power dissipation. The voltage drop is, as before, 10 volts. But what about the current? With linear regulators, the input and the output currents were the same. Here, the input current is much lower than the output current. So, we cannot use the same calculation as before. We have to calculate the input power as 1.86 Watt and the output power as 
1.65 Watt. So the loss is only 0.2 Watt. This is the reason for the coolness of this device. And the efficiency is 89%. Compared with the 25% from before, not bad. And what about the dropout voltage? Specified is a minimum voltage of 12 volts, hence a dropout voltage of 8.7 volts. But this is not true. Mine runs down to about 4 volts. But watch out, the smaller the input voltage, the bigger the input current, because it always have to match the needed output power. When we look a little closer, we find another difference, output ripple. Because there is a switch inside this regulator, the output voltage is not entirely constant. It has a high frequency overlay. We see regular peaks when we switch the oscilloscope to AC and zoom in. Its frequency is around 500 kHz. If we look at the full spectrum, we see that it has lots of harmonics at 1 MHz, at 1.5 MHz and so on. This is a real AM sender like in the old days. But what about higher frequencies? My spectrum analyzer shows that it emits signals up to 1 GHz. You see the difference if I switch the regulator on and off. My FM radio on the smartphone stops receiving if its antenna, in this case the headphones, come close to the regulator. Close to a LoRa receiver, this device is probably not a good idea. And if you want to do audio stuff or work with precise sensors, you might also get problems with noise. So the linear and the switching regulators behave very differently. And some switchers can do something a linear regulator cannot do. They can increase voltage. This is a neat feature and these unique switchers are called step up or boost converters because their output voltage is higher than the input voltage. Let's assume you still want to power a 3.3 volt device and you only have an AAA battery with 1.2 volts. With this small boost converter you can do that. And it delivers enough energy for an ESP chip. Maybe something for your next project? One thing we did not look at so far. If we want to deep sleep our devices. A barebone ESP module consumes only a few microamperes during deep sleep and the battery lasts very long. What about our regulators? To simulate a minimum load I leave the output of the regulator opened and I measure the input current with my microcurrent gold. This minimum current is called quiescent current. My AMS1117 has a quiescent current of 3.3 mA, which is lower than specified, but a few 100 times higher than what the ESP uses during deep sleep. Please be not astonished if the battery of your ESP project does not work long if you use this regulator. The HT7771 is much better in this respect. I measure around 6 microampere, which is similar to an ESP's deep sleep current. This regulator still reduces your battery life, but only a bit. The big surprise for me are the switchers. The buck converter has a quiescent current of around 250 microampere depending on the input voltage. This is much less than an AMS1117. I would have expected a much higher current because of all these parts. And if we connect the enable pin to ground, the output switch is entirely off and the quiescent current goes to 63 microampere. And the boost converter? Its quiescent current is only 6 microampere, similar to the HT7771. Also here, you can use it for a battery-powered project without harming the battery life too much. Great news for me. We could continue to talk about many things like transient response, which is vital to reduce peaks or noise reduction of regulators. But these are usually less important and harder to measure. So we call it a day and summarize what we covered so far. We wanted to power our 3.3 volt devices with different sources of power. If we do not use LiFePO4 batteries, we need some voltage regulation. We covered the two different principles for control of voltage, linear regulators and switching regulators. 
linear regulators consist of a variable resistor and a controller to adjust the resistor according to the needs of the load to keep the output voltage constant. We smoked a small resistor to understand that linear regulators have to convert the voltage difference between input and output into heat. This is why their efficiency is not very high. And for big differences between input and output voltages at higher currents, we need big heat sinks to dissipate the heat produced. Input and output current is always the same for linear regulators. We also saw that we have to look at the degrees centigrade per watt to calculate the maximum current. Reading the title with the maximum current is not sufficient. Switching converters use a switch instead of a resistor to regulate the output power. Switches do not create a lot of heat. This is why these regulators have higher efficiency and can be built much smaller for higher currents or higher differences between input and output voltage. But they are usually bigger than linear regulators for low power applications. Unfortunately, they produce a ripple on the output line and emit high frequency signals. These signals can hurt radio communication, precise sensors or audio applications. Better use a linear design in these situations. Converters which need a higher input voltage than their output voltage are called step-down or buck converters. Converters which are OK with a lower input voltage than their output voltage are called step-up or boost converters. We also find buck boost converters, sometimes also called SEPIC converters. Their input voltage can be smaller or bigger than the output voltage. They are usually bigger devices and were not covered here. Each regulator needs some difference between its input and output voltage to do a proper job. Regulators with a low dropout voltage are called LDO. If we want to deep sleep our microcontrollers, we have to watch out for a low quiescent current. We found significant differences in these matters. But the switchers were better than I thought. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the descriptions. Thank you. Bye.